right now, I'm going to show you how to nature journal in the cloud forest. So this is the Choco Andino Cloud Forest in Ecuador and is one of the most biodiverse places on the earth. And it is also a very endangered ecosystem. So I'm gonna start with sort of the bigger picture. I'm gonna use a similar strategy to what I usually do when I'm nature journaling. Um, try not to worry too much about your initial subject. So getting started on the blank page can often be scary, especially if it's the first drawing of the day. And um, don't try not to have too much outcome dependence or sort of expectations on your first pages because that's probably just gonna slow you down. You don't wanna get too perfectionist from the start. So um, something quick um, to get the page started, something general is probably what I usually would go for. So sort of like a scene, um, like a scene, landscape ito type thing, but also important um, is your metadata. So I'm gonna show you that um, really quickly right now. So I like to do my metadata in a little square up here at the top of my page. Location, temperature, other aspects of weather, who you're with, and what time. Basically, where you are in time and space. So I'm at, um, I'm gonna put the date first. Actually, that's what I've been doing lately, and I think it's October 3rd. And it's in the region of Pichincha, which is the name of the close volcano that I painted this morning, Pichinch, Pichincha, a volcano that could potentially cover this entire area in a pyroclastic flow and deadly hot sand. Um, there's a layer of topsoil here, um, almost a foot deep. And then underneath that, there's a layer that's like uh, three feet or a meter deep of volcanic sand or ash so and then underneath that there's another layer of soil and then underneath that there's another layer of volcanic ash so it's always good to remember uh life on earth is uh impermanent sometimes especially in the vicinity of volcanoes but that also provides a lot of fertility as well um pichincha and then i'll put ecuador the metadata is also a good way to break in the page so i know it sounds boring and maybe you came because you just wanted to draw or watch someone else drawing in this video but this is actually really important and if you're not doing this you're almost not nature journaling it's sort of like back when you were a kid you wouldn't get credit if you didn't put your name and the date and your classroom and stuff on the paper so i'm not going to give you credit on your nature journal page if you don't include metadata at least a little bit you can add it afterwards if you're really inspired and there's a hummingbird right there that you need to draw first thing in the morning that's fine but at some point get this down because you're going to be sorry later if you don't get it So I'm not doing this in the ideal way. Um, ideally, I would have framed this very um, intentionally and looked at it. I'm kind of um, freehanding it and just including elements from a variety of places into the drawing without having a clear idea of the framing. That is um, definitely not ideal. Okay, and then this um, fern is actually going to be really tricky to draw because of the compound leaves. So I might leave that and actually draw it with my paintbrush and watercolor. So I'm gonna leave the leaves. Maybe what I'll do is just kind of indicate where they are with the ink, little dots. There were some toucans here yesterday and crested guans, both really cool birds. Tons of tanager species in this entire forest. All right, so I put in, I, I sort of put in like an anchor of, of black ink. And I think this can really help with lands, watercolor landscape. So a lot of times with watercolor 
um, especially when people are first getting started. But even after doing it for years, it can be hard to get your dark values. And so um, one way to make sure you get your dark values in is to, to start with an anchor that's completely black. And that might not be, you know, really what you see but it can often create um, the sense of depth, which is one of the most important things to try to get with, um, with a landscape, is depth. It's probably the most, it's like top two most important things for creating a landscape painting. So now I'm gonna drop in watercolor. Okay, so this part of the page can sometimes be a little bit hard to watercolor, but not too worried about it. I'm going to start with a really pale um, blue. The sky's not even that blue at all. <clears throat> I might have to add in more trees over this at some point anyways. And the rule of thumb is that the sky will be more blue and darker at the top and getting paler towards the horizon. So perfect for watercolor to do a graded wash coming down. So look at that. See how that fades from um, darker blue, more saturated blue, to almost white at the bottom. That's what you want. Um, if you don't get wet all the way down to the bottom, you can come in here um, in the front. So I'm gonna start now with my most saturated green for the foreground. at least for one little, a uh, couple little highlights. I'm gonna put some into this bromeliad and I'm gonna show you how to combine um, two colors on this bromeliad. So the base of the leaves, I'm gonna start with say a little yellow green like that. Quickly clean my paintbrush. And once my paintbrush is, gonna, is clean, I'm gonna get this um, quinacridone pink and I'm actually gonna tone it down slightly with this um, naphthamide maroon. And what I'm gonna do now is while this, these bromeliad leaves are still wet, I'm gonna come in here and um, put some of that pinkish red color on the tips of the leaves and let it bleed a little bit into the green. These are basically complementary colors on the color wheel, so they're directly across from each other. And it just so happens that a lot of the bromeliads have those two colors. Um, combined so they tone each other nicely if one is too saturated you can tone it with the other or you can underpaint the green on everything um, if you want and then just uh, do the pink over the tips or you can do sort of a wet on wet like I just did okay now while that is drying I'm going to come in here and put the um see the little fiddle neck the tips of the um, tree fern i'm going to get those with like a quinacridone gold type color so i'm trying to get in um, my palest colors first usually in watercolor you're starting with pale and um building up darker and darker i thought i heard an animal walking towards me there's a species of bear here um, the only species of bear in south america inhabits this region and there's no jaguars here I don't think there's there are pumas and a couple of species of peccary armadillos okay so you can see I kind of have been jumping around getting some of these pale colors in while the sky is drying Still need to get this hanging branch here, but that's still a little bit wet. Okay, now I'm gonna put in some of my mid-tone, mid-values and paint around where I think these fern leaves are gonna be eventually. I guess I could paint, maybe I could paint through all of them and then do the darker on top. So I'm just gonna take this chromium oxide, sort of like a middle, middle value green and paint in pretty much this whole area. I can still see those dots. So my underdrawing to know where the fern leaves are is still gonna be fine. Sometimes in the cloud forest, it's um, so humid 
that watercolor is really challenging because nothing ever dries and your paints themselves start to kind of spill out and, and make a mess. But a lot of times, like right now it's the dry season, so it rains every day in the dry season, by the way. Um, but uh, it is um, the dry season, so usually the mornings it's not raining. Okay, this sky is still wet, so I don't want to. I want to be careful about not painting in anything there. So you can see that's a pretty good mid value. Luckily, I have that black in already. That black's really helping me out now. So I'm gonna wait for that to dry, and then I'm gonna paint in the um, the leaves from the uh, tree fern. Okay, so that's dry enough for me to add in some layers. You can see that the light is changing and there's some really cool stuff where um, some of the further away, um, further away layers of, of trees have more of a warm color on them. I'm not gonna include that. So it, it's possible to do sort of like a cloud forest landscape, like a window like this where the foreground elements are dark and then the further away ones are actually warmer and potentially more saturated, but that is actually going opposite of the way um, atmospheric perspective usually works. So that is a little bit tricky. It can be a really beautiful effect, but can be confusing. For right now, I'm gonna stick with the way that I use this black for the background. Um, and keep it simple and not try to add in all of those layers. Usually less is more when it comes to landscape paintings, especially when you're getting started and you're just nature journaling. Um, try to keep it simple and just focus on a few things at a time. So what I'm gonna do now actually is I'm gonna come in and color this, um, get this hanging stuff here and also get the leaves of this fern um, into my painting. And I'm gonna do all that with my um, trusty watercolor brush and watercolor palette. And I think I'm just gonna use the same chromium oxide color that I used for this sort of middle ground. Um, and then some brown for the base of the, I'm gonna start with the brown actually. This is Monte Amiata Natural Sienna. So it, a, a, a sienna that hasn't been um, burnt or, or cooked. I think that's what that means. I think it comes from a mountain in Italy. I'm running out of that color too, so um, I won't be able to refill until I get back to California sometime in like three months. So there's definitely epiphytes covering a lot of this trunk. But I'm going to just pretend like I don't see that. Now I'm going to try to get these fronds. So simplifying the complexes can be one of the more challenging things um, in, in art in general. And I'm going to do my best right now to try to um, simplify the complexity of these fronds. And I'm actually going to do something that you usually don't do, but I'm going to, I think I'm going to go straight from my pigment um, into my painting without really diluting it at all. All right, so what is the most important part to capture on these fronds. They have pointy tips, but then after that, it's kind of like. I'm not gonna capture, they're, they're doubly compound leaves. And you could spend, if I were doing a botanical illustration, I could spend a month drawing one of those leaves. It's almost like a fractal, the closer you look at it the more complex it gets. So sometimes you have to come up with a shorthand way for um, simplifying that pattern. And these little chevrons seem to be doing the trick just fine. I'll take that, thank you very much. I'm glad I didn't try to draw that with my um, ink tool at the beginning. There are some dead ones um, or browning ones hanging down to the ground. love that song. Unfortunately, the Merlin app, it has a sound identification feature, but it doesn't, um, doesn't work very well here. Maybe they haven't tested it enough. Okay, so now I'm going to come in with some of the brown ones that are hanging down. 
Um, actually, while I have this green, I'm just going to paint a little bit here. Clean my brush on my pants. All right, so I'm going to come in here with this. I think this is the um, burnt umber. And I'm going to fade these into a darker brown and at the same time do some of the fronds that are hanging down. So watercolor, I usually don't draw with watercolor, but figuring out what are the things you can draw with watercolor can save you a ton of time um, for nature journaling. So um, watercolor can be faster with certain things. And if you let watercolor do a little bit more of the work, um, you can speed up the process. I'm almost done here. And this was pretty fast and it captures a lot of information and feeling um, quickly. So I'm gonna get this moss color. A lot of the moss here is, is, is pretty yellow in fact. And I'm gonna put it in here. This is also a very warm color, so it's good that it's in the foreground. Oh, there's another really pretty bird sound that I want to identify. It reminds me of the, um, there's a thrush. I think it's the Swainson's, no. Um, I'm blanking on it. In North America, there's a thrush. Oh, I just heard a very large bird land in a tree might be the crested fawn. So I'm actually in a little bit of a wildlife corridor right here for birds. There weren't very many birds when I first got here. It's definitely possible that a large number of birds will move through this area. If you haven't already seen my video on the secret birding strategy, it's all about finding a tree or a landscape ito, nature journaling that tree or landscape ito, and while you're there, um, birds will move into your area and because you're in one spot for a long time painting a landscape ito or nature journaling a tree it means you're quiet and the animals get sort of used to you so the best some of the best birding experience I've, I've had are when I'm using that secret technique it's not really secret anymore because I made a video about it on YouTube So let's see if some cool birds might come through here. That would be the perfect thing to start filling in my page now that I have this landscape um, basically finished. I hear tanagers coming in. Oh yeah, here we go. You know, I think that's fine right there. I think I'm gonna start getting ready for uh, nature journaling these birds that are coming through. A lot of times in the um, tropics, at least in the new world, I don't know about the old world, birds moved and move in these mixed um, foraging flocks or bands, and you'll have a lot of different species all moving together in one group. Super interesting. Mixed species flocks. I just saw one of my favorite, the um, flame faced tanager. of birds like really simple like that
there is a squirrel over here, so a mammal. So you can see, I'm not even pulling out my color right now. There's there's too many birds and I need to move too quickly. So I'm just making some color notes um, and getting these quick sketches in. And this is gonna help me later. Like if I'm trying to use an app like Merlin, it, it I don't have reception out here, so I can't use that app. Getting these notes down in this way is gonna help my memory and improve my experience. But also if I'm trying to use an app like Merlin to actually identify these birds later, this is really helpful. It's an essential in fact, unless you have like a really expensive camera and you can take photos of these small birds from far away. Blue, oh, green on the back. Oh, it has yellow on the, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap. What was that? Oh yeah, toucan, baby. Yes, heck yeah, Ramphastos ambiguous. Yellow-throated toucan. It could be the Choco subspecies, but I'm pretty sure it's the more widespread. So we got a toucan moving in. I don't know if it's, I would consider it part of the mixed flock. But we've got a toucan. It's sort of over by the squirrel. And I barely got a glimpse of it, but I'm just gonna get a quick little. The toucans are loud when they fly. You can hear the wings flapping pretty loud. frequently use playback, but I am going to um, use playback right now very quickly. Playback is when you use a recording of a bird. Um, you use the recording of the bird. This is why I need someone to film me. I'm trying to move this around on this unstable slope here. All right, I'm going to play a little bit of the um, toucan song or call and see if I can get that toucan to come closer. And so that's why I'm trying to position the camera a little bit better here. Okay, so I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play um, toucan on Merlin app and see if I can get that bird to come in closer. So I've already downloaded this um, package and for my location, so I can easily access it even when, um, even when I don't have connection. So this is the species I think it is right here. Um, and in the Merlin app, you have sounds. So watch, let's see what happens right now. Okay. 
first started playing it. Got the ear somewhere. So I'm going to make a note that I tried using playback. I'm right in the flight path. A bunch of the tangers of this mixed flock have been flying right past me. And some of them are the ones I've been trying to get a closer look at for a while. Um, like this chlorospigus, I think it is, and the um, barrel speckled, spangled tanager also, which is just an extraordinary blue tanager with um, streaking. Both of them just flew in really close. I got a better look at both of those. So look at how simple these drawings are at this at this stage. Um, I'm, I might add color to them when I get home or maybe once this band of birds has moved on, but sometimes you just need to move as quickly as possible and having the watercolor out sometimes can slow you down a little bit. Okay, so another important thing is I just noticed one of the chlorospigus, what I think is a, a type of chlorospigus, a type of tanger. Um, I just noticed one land on, fly out of the trees on the edge of the forest and land on the ground in the pasture um, to forage on the ground. So that's like a behavioral thing that if you're just going for a pretty page, you might not write down. Or if you're just trying to identify a bunch of birds, you might not write down. But that's actually really interesting in my opinion. So I'm going to write that down underneath that bird that I saw it um, briefly foraged on the ground. Okay, another important step is to kind of stop before you're done. Um, this is my before breakfast session, so I've got a little bit of description in. I did a, a, another watercolor before coffee, but um, uh, before breakfast, after coffee, I feel like this is a pretty good session in. I am going to go back and eat breakfast and come out and do some more Cloud Forest nature journaling after this. So, I was supposed to be walking back up this hill um, for breakfast but I got totally distracted because um, I saw a couple birds um, that are new to me I'm currently like pretty addicted to um, birding and just trying to get new species which I've often made fun of in the past um, as you might remember but it, it can be super fun um, and super addictive and give kind of like a meaning to or like a, a, a sense of purpose and motivation to um, your time outside so I think it's you know it's it, it could be a worse addiction so um, anyways I saw something that I thought was maybe a wren or a, a wood creeper or a wood haunter um, and was trying to figure out what it was. Um, I also got a closer look at some of these um, chlorospingus um, birds. So that was really cool. And I'm walking back up through this um, ancient trail system. So these, the, there are these ancient footpaths that are carved into the ground from generations of people just walking through them. Look how deep this is in here. And this was like a pre-Inca um, tribe and they maintain these um, trade routes through this really challenging terrain um, connecting the um, Central Valley sort of plateau area with um, the coast where they could get salt. Look at this! That looks like an active hole right there. Notice this um, loose dirt at the bottom some of which has fallen down here. 
That's the size of an active. Should I put my hand in there? That is the size of an active. Uh, that is the sign of an active um, hole. Uh, I wonder if I should put my hand in there. Holes. I wonder if there's any tracks. Very interesting. It looks like a challenging spot to climb up, so probably not like an armadillo, I don't think. It's too small for an armadillo. Very large tarantula, perhaps.